Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, the scripture reading today is in 1 Peter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. So be it. So, Debbie, the rest of that scripture reads this way from Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, not just Debbie or Sherry or Polly or Bonnie, all of us. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his people. We are, the, are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his loving devotion endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. And whether Debbie thinks she makes a joyful noise or not, Sherry wouldn't sing without her joyful noise. And if I wanted anyone to lead me in making joyful noises, it would be Debbie. <laughs> Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you that you choose to love us, that you are not worried about the perfection that we have, but the willingness that we have to serve, that you don't look at a man's outward appearance, but you look at his heart. And Father, I do thank you for being able to shepherd a church whose hearts are devoted to you. Lord, help us to use the Spirit's power to renew our minds so that our hearts Focus on living a life that brings glory and honor to you. Lord, help us to come to church and worship you with thanksgiving in our hearts so that when we go out into the world that we tell others of the hope that we have and that we tell others of the hope that we have because we do live such godly, holy lives that they see Jesus living in us. And Father, we do pray today for the Awana ministry. Lord, we pray that you're working in the lives of the parents and the children and the workers. And Lord, we just pray for this to be a great year that we teach these children to be approved workmen who won't be ashamed on that day when they meet Jesus face to face. Thank you for this warm building that we're in, Lord, and we thank you for the people that serve your, your community, your church. Lord, help us to use all the spiritual gifts that we have given to serve you with the gladness in our heart that the world sees. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I messed up this week. I even told you some fibs. That's your fire. Yep. Because I said in Awanas that we, first of all, that we were reading uh, Second Peter, and we're not supposed to be reading Second Peter. If you look on the calendars, we went from First Peter to the Gospel of John. But I just assumed that after First Peter, we'd read Second Peter. So... That's what the videos are on this week. They're on Second Peter, and that's what I've done. And so we'll get back to John next week, which means you'll have John chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So you need to catch up with John 1 through 3 sometime before then. Got me? And that's not First John, Second John, Third John. It's the Gospel of John, chapter 1 through 3, and then starting Monday, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Does that make sense? And that's a lot to cover. So you've got a lot of reading to do and a lot of time to go back and meditate and study because that's a lot of scripture packed in those, in those different chapters. I could spend months on John chapter 6. I could spend months on John chapter 3 and I could go on and on. So you'll be briefly hitting that. And we talked about that Summit Bible Study. Maybe we'll go into John first of the year because John wrote his gospel so that you might believe. And if anybody lived a changed life besides 
Paul for sure, it was John because he was one of the sons of Zebedee that wanted to rain down fire on those who didn't want to accept Jesus. And then you see later in his life where he is the, the author of love, that you, you can't know God unless you love, that you take your love and put it into actions, that if you don't love your brother, how can the world can you love God? Which is exactly what Jesus said when he summed up the greatest commandment. So we're going to cover 2 Peter, but you also read for sure 1 Peter chapter 4 and 5 last week. Everybody's on the same page there, right? So that's where Merle started. He started with 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And he asked me a question this morning that went right along with this scripture. He asked me about the man that was blind. Was he blind or par paralytic? Paralytic, because I don't want to say it wrong, because there it goes to what I said wrong. I said that uh, on Awana's Wednesday night, that a, but I said I didn't know for sure, so I'll cover my tracks. That the ark was about three football fields long. And I kept thinking, is it a football field or three football fields? It's neither one, it's right in between. A football field and a half. Yeah, so that's where I'm gonna start out Wednesday with my approved workman and see if anybody caught me. Because I don't have a problem when you catch me in something. As a shepherd, that means that you are following and saying, hey, did you mean to say that? Okay. So I've got some questions to ask you about the flood and things today that will get you thinking as well. But Merle said, the, asked about the paralytic because Jesus healed him. He's the one that sat by the pool forever and ever and waited for the waters to be stirred. And then he would try to get there, but someone else would get bef there before him. And then Jesus healed him. And then later Jesus healed him and he said, don't sin anymore. Go and sin no more. And Merle said, well, what was his sin? And that's exactly where we're at today because Peter wrote his first letter to the churches, to the exiles that are scattered abroad because they've lost their homes because of persecution. And they're scattered to wherever they're at. So they're not relying on their faith and their hope and their trust in things anymore. They're relying on God to take care of them. Or they're going to walk away from the faith because of the persecution. And the persecution is surmounting incredibly. So we get to 2 Peter, and the Spirit reveals to Peter that he is not going to make it out of prison this time. He is going to die. And let me set the scene for you. This is the time that Nero has taken over Rome, and whether he's a lunatic or whatever he is, he's lit the, uh, uh, the town on fire, and he blames the Christians because he's got to find some place to blame them. And the script, Christians become the scapegoats. And he persecutes Christians to death in horrendous ways. He even takes Christians, hoists them up on poles in the streets, douses, douses them with tar and pitch, and lights them on fire. Can you imagine the screaming sounds, the burning flesh? And I'm not here to gross you out. This is what Christians faced so Peter's saying, I'm not going to make it through this and I don't want you to lose your faith because the testing of your faith is going to come like you've never seen it. And we want to complain. <laughs> We're spoiled. But on the same time, we have such an opportunity to tell others about the joy that we have. If we have the joy. If we're not just all bah humbug because of the problems that we face in our life that are so terrible. He writes this letter because these Christians are going to be suffering to death. They've already suffered, and he's saying, suffer some more and do it with joy. So when you read 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, this is one of those Bible verses that again, because one reason that Peter is preaching to them, teaching to them, is because there are false prophets. He even says that in the closing of this letter. He um, commends Paul, says that he agrees with Paul, and he, but he also says Paul has some maybe some strange ways of saying things, but the th things he says are the truth. Because people want to take one little thing out of context and apply it to how they want to make God in their image instead of letting God mold them into his image. That means that we live a set-apart holy life. That the, the spirit that God has given us, everything that we need to live a godly life. That when we continue to pray to God, we keep seeking, we keep asking, we keep knocking, that what good Father and, and our Heavenly Father 
surpasses and trumps all that. What good father is not going to give good gifts, but Jesus said, you keep on and you keep on, and God's going to give you more of the Holy Spirit. Not that He's going to give you more wealth. Not that He's going to give you more health. Not that He's going to give you more children. Not that He's going to give you more disciples. When Paul is, is facing death in prison, he's writing to one Timothy, telling him not to avoid the, the truth, to stand firm in his faith, no matter what the cost, no matter who else follows. So this suffering that, that is coming, you have everything that you have available for you. Now maybe, just maybe, you think, you'll say not even go here, that the rapture will let you escape the tribulation coming. <laughs> maybe. But God will give you His Spirit every bit that you need to face any persecution coming. So that you can be like Christians literally in the world today that are dying in the name of Jesus Christ. Watching their children die in the name of Jesus Christ. And they do not lose hope. They do not profess another gospel. And this is one of those scriptures that gets twisted already. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, some of the teachers said, ah, Christ didn't suffer in the flesh. He was really in spirit form, and you just thought you saw him in the flesh. So therefore, he didn't really die. And therefore, you guys that are facing suffering, you don't really have this hope because the people that have died before you, they're dead. This is the kind of doctrine that's being spread, and you might can relate some of this doctrine to some of the doctrine that's out there today. Therefore, this is summing up what Paul said before, since Christ suffered in His body. Suffered. He suffered to death. Real, physical death. Because if he didn't come in the form of a man, he couldn't have died for mankind's sins. If he didn't live a holy, set-apart life, his, his sacrifice would not have been acceptable to God. He was 100% man, 100% God. He 100% died on the cross. He 100% raised up from the dead. 100% will come back to get you so you can be with him forever. And you will suffer, but he will wipe every tear away and you won't suffer anymore. So the light and momentary sufferings of this world mean nothing compared to the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. So therefore, since Christ Jesus suffered in His body, arm yourselves with the same mind because anyone who has suffered in His body is done with sin. Consequently, He does not live out the remaining time on earth for human passions but for the will of God. Now I could stay here for hours, but I won't. Wake up. <laughs> because we got more ground to cover. But what does this verse say to you? Merle said it this morning. Jesus came back and said, Go sin no more. What was the man's sin? Why was he suffering in this world? Now I'm adding to that. Merle didn't say that, just so you but the reason that's the case is because that's the world what the world thinks. You think that way. Don't tell me you don't. When something happens, there's a little thing called karma, which is a Buddhist principle, what comes around goes around type thing. You think that because this person's suffering, they've done something to deserve it. Yeah, we have. Every last one of us. The wages of our sins is eternal death. But the gift of God is salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's the difference. So we all deserve God's wrath, but Jesus took it on the cross. The person out there that's suffering however they're suffering, and when you get to talking to your brothers and sisters who have the same spirit living in them, who've had the same spirit comfort them, that you can find out just talking to them that they can comfort you because they've probably been through something just like you have. They've probably been through something worse than you've had. And the difference is how you view them in walking through that. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Then why do we fear evil? Why do we say, woe is me? Why is it happening to me? What did I do to do deserve this? Jesus told him not to sin anymore because his sins had been forgiven. If he could forgive the man's ailment, he can forgive his sins. 
So don't go sin anymore and be an example. There's no accusation that you have been doing these sins, but we all are guilty of them. There's no accusation that you should be suffering any more than anybody else. There's an accusation that you were a sinner and now you're not. You've been given everything that you need to live a holy, godly life. So therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself. What does that mean? That's a military term that you arm yourself with the things that are at your disposal, disposal to fight the enemy. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going into battle, I want some big armory to back me. You have God's armor, back, armory backing you. Everything that's in the spiritual realms is available to you through the power of God's Spirit. You know what else that arm means? That arm means that badge, that crest that they wear that says, I belong to the United States Marines. <laughs> right? I belong to the Lord's army. And I don't know about the world, how they'll view that. They might mock you and persecute you, especially since the scriptures say that you don't do the things that you used to do and they can't understand why. But when they see you living such godly lives, they have to keep scratching their head and then maybe they'll ask you of the hope that you have. But if you're not living differently and when you're suffering, you act the same way, you act out in vengeance or woe is me or whatever else, then they say, well, they're not really any different. But yet they wore this patch on their arm that said, I'm in the Lord's army. And what I read says that I have victory in Jesus and everything else. So why does this Christian not believe what he reads, she reads? So to do that, you have to arm yourselves with the same mind that Jesus had. Well, what does that mean? Hmm, well, I'll give you a few examples when we close. That'll be my final point so you know I'm closing. She knows what that means. That's an inside joke. The same mind that Jesus had. Because anyone who suffered in his body or in the flesh is done with sin. Now here's where people go way off the rails on this verse. Because some of them, we don't have the thing so much today that Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. It's this done with sin part that brings up false doctrine. Does it mean that I am totally sanctified? We can't agree on that, that topic. What it means if I have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, then I won't desire anything earthly. I will hate sin. I will want to bring glory and honor to my Father. I will want to live a righteous, holy life because others are seeing it. I want to live as Jesus lived in this world because I have the mindset of Jesus. Therefore, <laughs> I'm done with sin. It has no desire for me whatsoever. I'm waiting for the day when Jesus Christ returns, because that's in my mindset, and wipes every tear. And there is no more pain and no more suffering. And I'm going to live my life as a light to the world so that others, especially the ones that I love the most, come and follow after me because I'm following after Jesus. So what did that mean I needed to do? Deny myself and suffer. I'll put that word in there because I'm following Jesus. Verse 2, Consequently, that person, the Christian, the believer, does not live out his remaining time on earth for human passions, but for the will of God. The extremity of that is the young man that Jesus said, go sell everything that you have because you're still clinging to this world. I'll honestly say this, and you'll probably start crying in a minute, but if my son and my grandkids weren't ripped from me, I would have held them before God. I would have said, I need to take care of them right now. But if he called me to a foreign mission field right now, I'd say, I don't have anything standing in the way. If you understand that. What stands in the way? Of course this church does, don't get me wrong. But sometimes the best things that we hold on to in life are the things that we put our love into. The things we put our trust into. The things we put our hope into. And they do not matter compared to putting our faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ because of the love that God has. Then the love for others will come. And He doesn't necessarily make you do the things that you might fear to do, but he knows if your heart is willing to do it. Does that make sense? 
That word same mindset is used only one other time in Scripture. Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 14. You should know Hebrews 4, 12. It's an Awana verse. Okay? For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Okay, let's get into debate here. What is this joint and marrow stuff? I hear that so much. No, no, no. What is this thoughts and intentions of the heart? That's the same word. The mindset of Jesus. That's my thoughts and intentions. This word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword which cuts in and cuts coming out. It cuts and divides what we don't even understand what is... Uh, soul and spirit, the dividing part, because there's a trichotomy or a dichotomy of man, and Bob knows for sure what those words are. You may not, not know. But that's the things that we debate about as far as religion. It doesn't matter if you know that. The Word of God is living and powerful, and if you read it, it will cut in and it will cut out till you have the changed mindset. Paul says, therefore, by the mercies of God, that he... Uh, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of service. And you do that by the renewing of your mind. That the Holy Spirit reveals to you the mindset of why would God love me so much that He would send His only Son to die for me. It gives you that mindset of how loved you are as a child of God. So if He loves you that much, He'll take care of you no matter what suffering is going on in your life. And when you walk through it, you can help others. And when the world sees you walk through it, they're going to ask you, how did you walk through that? How could you stay faithful and joyful through that experience? It's because of the hope I have in Jesus. Verse 13 says, Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and exposed before the eyes of Him who must give an account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we profess. Suffering. What do you think about it? No one wants to go through it. Be honest. It's natural to say, why me? But Scripture tells you that suffering is part of a Christian's life and therefore testimony and therefore accountability to God and therefore rewards in heaven. They all work together. Don't you want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? It's going to be hard to hear if you don't want to ever go through and won't go through the sufferings should a child of God suffer? I hope I made that point that everyone suffers because of their sin. And P Peter writes in here that it's starting with the household of God, this suffering. Because this persecution that's coming on the church is going to last for over 200 years. Severe persecution. We don't have that. So doesn't that give us more of an opportunity to proclaim the gospel message and to live as a Christian should live in this world? Oh wait, what does that mean, live as a Christian in, in, in this world? Little Christ, to live as Christ. The one whose mindset was, I'll give up heaven. I'll come and be born of the very creation that I did. I won't have a home or place to lay my head. I'll care about others. I'll meet their needs and build relationships with them. And then once I do... I'll tell them about the righteous requirement that I have for them to not sin anymore because salvation is coming to their household and they have to accept it or deny it. And you've planted the seeds and part of the way of you planting the seeds is because you lived like Christ in this world. And to do that, you have to have His mindset. But what about when I suffer? It's fine when other people suffer and I get to see them walk through. But what about when I suffer? Boy, that's really when I need to have the mindset of Christ, isn't it? 
1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that has come upon you, as though something strange were happening to you. They crucified our Lord and Savior. If we act and live like Christ in this world, what is the world going to do to us? 1 Peter 4, 1 said, Christ suffered in His body. Why would Peter write that Christ suffered in His body if He did not really suffer in His body? And he's writing about a fiery trial or, or ordeal that's coming along here because it literally is a fiery trial or ordeal. And wouldn't you rather face the fiery trial or ordeal that's coming now than, race, than face the fires of an eternal hell? Oh, there's some doctrine that says there's not. We can go on that trail. But let's just say that there might be, that there is. Isn't momentary fire better than eternal fire? Isn't your faith in Jesus Christ, if you really profess to believe in Him, worth living out in this world? Verse 13, I'll read verse 12 again first. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that comes upon you as though something strange were happening to you, but, what does that mean? Complete opposite. Rejoice that you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed at the revelation of His glory. Do you understand that? Not only should you not think that you should go through sufferings or be surprised when they come your way, but instead be joyful, complete opposite. And not only be joyful, but be so full of joy that when the day comes when He does wipe every tear away, that you're overjoyed. Wow. And Peter's writing these real words to real Christians who are suffering. If we keep reading on in 1 Peter 4, verse 14, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Notice he didn't just say the Spirit of God in here, but he said the Spirit of glory. Because if you suffer with Christ, you will be raised up to glory with Christ. Verse 16 reads, If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but glorify God that you bear that name. Verse 17, For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? So then those who suffer according to God's will should entrust their souls to their faithful creator and continue to do good, even during these fiery sufferings that's coming upon you. When you're hoisted up and doused with tar and lit on fire, that instead of denying or saying, wait, I'm innocent and complaining, you say, praise be to God because he's saving me through the blood of Jesus. I'm so glad Debbie picked out those blood of Jesus songs today because that's what saved me. Not just blood, but Jesus pouring out his life blood for me. That you can't save that person. That person is bleeding out and that blood is covering the atonement seat and then it's making me white in God's eyes, pure, spotless, because Jesus gave up his life for me. But what about this suffering thing? We're going to go backwards a second in 1 Peter, and I want to write how he started out his first letter. 1 Peter 1, verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice. Didn't we just hear that? Though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in various trials. But see, that's what he wrote in 1 Peter. Here we are in 2 Peter, where we've kicked up the oven a bunch of degrees. <laughs> okay? You do that in verse 7, so that the proven character of your faith, which is more precious than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, may result in what? Praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All he's doing is expounding to the Christians about what he wrote in the first place where he said, hey, you're going to suffer and be joyful about it. Now he's saying, boy, are you going to suffer and die and rejoice about it. And don't just rejoice, but be ecstatic about it. And... Continue to know that the Spirit of God rests upon you and the Spirit of glory rests upon you because you will be glorified for being obedient even unto death, even the death of a cross which Peter would face. 
If we go on to verse 13 and 14 of 1 Peter 1, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Grace? How is suffering and being set aflame, literally, how is that gracious of God? Because of the outcome. This life is nothing compared to eternal life. And you've got to light and show the way by the way you face these fiery trials. Not just how you rock your faith when things are good. Even the righteous, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, they lend to their enemies. You lend without expe expecting payment in return. They expect payment. Well, I'm supposed to lend without even expecting you to pay back? Oh, let's go on a little further. You're supposed to love your enemy to the point when they ask you for your tunic or your coat that you give them your shirt also. But the natural thing to say then is, wait a minute, if I had a coat on, it's cold outside first of all. <laughs> now it would be cold. But if I give them my shirt on top of that, and this is my enemy, then I'm not only going to be cold, but I'm going to be naked. And the rest of the world is going to see me and say, what an idiot, what a fool. Because he follows Jesus. But your enemy's going to say, why did he do that? And they might, just might one day come to you and say, tell me about Jesus, why you would be willing to do that. Especially when I was your enemy, that you would do that for me. Verse 14 of 1 Peter 1 says, As obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. Then we get in 1 Peter 3, verses 14 and 15. But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. And if you remember what happened before that that Peter wrote, was you're going to suffer to government authorities. Slaves are going to be beaten by their masters. Wives, you're going to be treated like property and abused. But live a godly example. Men are in there too. Godly men, you live an example and you raise your wife up as though she were weaker than you. Weaker means as something is precious, as a, what's the, a Ming vase, ancient Chinese vase that's priceless today. That's how you hold her up and look at her. Because God gave her to you to complete you. But you will suffer for me. So he says, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be shaken. So what's the opposite of trust? Fear. Why do you not trust God to carry you through the sufferings you bring, especially when the sufferings get greater and greater and greater and in more intensity? Is it because He doesn't care anymore? No, not at all. Because you have fear that still needs to be given to Him. John writes, again, John, the guy, the guy that wants to rain down fire from heaven, writes, perfect love casts out fear. <clears throat> but in your hearts, 1 Peter 3, 15, sanctify Christ as Lord. How do I sanctify Christ? He is holy already. I do it by the way that I live to show that I believe He is who He says He is. So Peter even writes that we are sanctifying Christ in our hearts. When we let our minds change our hearts so that our hearts change our behavior. In your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give a defense, a testimony to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. But make sure you respond with gentleness and respect. See, First Peter, he's leading up to all this suffering so that you can be a witness. Second Peter, the flames are upon you, buddy. So rejoice and do it even more because otherwise you're not sanctifying the Lord. Your testimony is invalid. First Peter 1 also we read, I mean, Second Peter 1 we read, His divine power in verse 3 gives us everything we need to live a godly, holy life through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and ex excellence. 
Verse 4, Through these He has given His precious and magnificent promises, so that through them you may become partakers in the divine nature, the nature that comes with the mindset of Christ, now that you have escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. But what does that mean? These Christians were exiled already to the foreign country, but the world was still coming in trying to tempt them to live like the devil, at least on the other days of the week, right? And that's a common philosophy in this country. I'm sorry, but it is. Go to church on Sunday, but live like the devil the rest of the week, and that's okay. That's a lie from Satan. You go to church to help get the training, iron sharpening iron, and get the training so that you can go out and live a holy life. And you get the equipping that you have here to present the gospel message. Not for me to do. I do it when I'm out in the streets too, but it's for all of us to do when we're out in the streets in whatever mission field we're in. Because we have escaped the corruption in this world caused by its evil desires and as a result will be persecuted for it. So Peter gives us a building block process. Did you notice that in 2 Peter? To your faith, supplement or add a heaping, helpful, a heaping handful of virtue, goodness. To virtue, knowledge, because you'll increase that mindset of Jesus Christ. To knowledge, self-control, because now that I have the mindset of Christ, I can have a little bit more control over these sinful desires that used to entice me. To self-control, I'm going to add perseverance or endurance so that I can get through all these things, all this corruption that used to bring me down and cause me to live an unholy life because I've been given everything I need to live a holy set-apart life. To perseverance, godliness, because now I'm starting to live like Jesus in this world. And to godliness, what? The second part of what Jesus said. What is the greatest commandment, teacher? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the guy had to question him, who's my neighbor? Right? But when it's said and done and Jesus says that, he says, go and do likewise and you will live. Just because you've heard it and you don't do it implies based off that, then don't do it and go and die because you weren't willing to follow after me so you really didn't have the faith that you profess to have. Go and do likewise. So then you get to this building block process and the last thing that you add to godliness is brotherly kindness until love. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love because love is what remains. Your faith becomes sight. Your hope becomes a reality. But the love that has saved you and sealed you is the love that will be forever and ever between God and man and man and man and whatever our new tent is. And it won't be a tent, guys. <laughs> that love remains. So you've got to love now. Then Peter goes on to write, just a few verses later, verse 8, For if you possess these qualities and you continue to grow in them, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Because as you do this, you are called to be royal priests. Think back to the Old Testament where the priests went in once a year and everything. You go to God daily. And you're bringing God to man by the way you live as a priest and a group of holy priests in this world. Wow. Wow. I think Moses and David and everybody are sitting there going, look what you're doing through the church if in fact you're living like the church. He goes on to write, Therefore, brothers, strive to make your calling and election sure so that you don't stumble and, oh, that you don't cause other people to stumble. There's so much Scripture here in this Second Peter and it's all based on the fact that Christians are suffering and dying and Peter's going to die and not be able to lead them anymore. Are you willing to suffer and die for Jesus? That's one thing. If you say you are, Peter said he was and then denied him three times, right? But will you suffer and die for your brother or sister? 
Will you suffer and die for your enemy? Because that's exactly what all of us were. But not now if you're a friend of Jesus. If you've believed in Jesus. And if you've believed in Jesus, as James said, that your faith will have works of righteousness. As Peter says, the same thing. And in that means that sufferings are going to come. How are you facing those sufferings in your life? And maybe the world doesn't see the doubt and fear that you have, but God still sees it. Your spouse probably sees it. Give Him your trust. Let Him know that you know your hope. Let the Spirit transform you from a caterpillar who would have ever thought it would have turned into this butterfly like this. That's so radically different. But what a great example. Because you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. None of that old is there. You've been equipped with everything that you need. Peter writes, Also, therefore, beloved, as you anticipate these things, to even anticipate them, Make every effort to be found in peace, spotless and blameless in His sight. Therefore, beloved, since you already know these things, be on your guard so that you will not be carried away by the error of lawlessness and fall from your secure standing. But instead, grow in grace, suffering, and knowledge, the mindset of Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. That's how Peter closes out this letter to grow in the mindset of Jesus, suffering and finding it joyful, so that you didn't live a worthless life, instead you lived a worthwhile, meaningful life, and that others saw the hope, even if you did not get to tell them in words, they saw your life. And there is that saying that actions speak louder than words. And they do. Because <laughs> they can nullify your words. Oh boy, can they nullify your words. Suffering then. I'm going to go back to it again and ask. Suffering. So when you suffer, what do you think? And I'm gl so glad you said that this morning. We think, why? Why me? What did I ever do? <laughs> right? I think there's a song about that one. What did I do? I sinned against a holy, righteous God and I deserve eternal death, never to be brought back, never to be forgiven, but because of His love, He would send His Son knowing it then that that's what it was going to cost. Jesus knowing that that's what He was going to do. And as a man, He sweated drops of blood and He said, Father, if you can get, take this cup from me, do it. But not my will, but yours. Because the mindset that Jesus has is also the mindset that God has, which is the mindset of the Holy Spirit which lives in you, which will reveal it as you read, study, gather together, use the spiritual gifts that's given you to be the body of Christ. As we build upon, like Peter says, this cornerstone called Jesus rather than stumbling upon Him, and we build other blocks till this building is complete and Jesus comes back to claim it. And this building is flesh and blood, which is spiritual, so we have to fix our eyes on Jesus and have His mindset. Does that mean that suffering won't hurt? No. It means that the Spirit will help you endure it. doesn't mean He'll take it away. Suffering hurts and no one wants suffering. But the end of suffering is salvation. The mindset of Jesus. What does that mean then? I asked you that question earlier. I'm going to give you a few examples. A desire to obey God and bring Him glory. A desire to seek and save the lost. Self-denial, submission, humility. A heart of compassion and love. A reliance on the Spirit. Holiness instead of fleshly desires. A passion even to give up your own life to unjust enemies and brutally suffer and die for this message that you proclaim. That's the mindset of Jesus Christ. That's just some examples. 
If one of them struck a chord with you, it wasn't me that did it. It was the Holy Spirit that did it in you. That you don't have that mindset and you need to pray for that. Oh, and be careful because if you pray for patience, you know what happens. And it's so funny when people pray for patience. They don't ever... How many times do you hear pr people pray, Oh, I would like to be a much better giver. What would come naturally next? They lose everything they have so that they can follow Jesus. Because all of us naturally have some trust and some faith and some hope in the things we see. It's natural. But we've got to get rid of that natural man and fill it with the Spirit so that the spiritual man will thrive. If I lose it all, it doesn't matter because I gained it all when Jesus died for me and He called me to be His. And that means living it every single day, even during the suffering. So I have to have that mindset. Suffering then. Let's talk about that just for a second. And then I'm going to close from some examples from Genesis. Because Peter mentions them here. Suffering. It's not a punishment. It has nothing to do with being unfair. So you have to get that out of your mind first of all. Here's what suffering is. It draws us to action instead of comfort. It purifies us. It humbles us. It makes us depend on God, trust on Him. It casts out our fears and doubts. It brings glory to God. That last one's a little weird. How does it bring glory to God when we're suffering? Because we're His children. And shouldn't the earth, the world think that why would His children suffer? What's the big question out is why, if it's God, is it God of love, is there suffering in this world? Especially with his own children. So let's go look at Noah. Because Peter writes about Noah. He writes about angels that have suffered, if you didn't notice that, and there's no hope for them. They're bound until the day they're cast into the lake of fire. He wrote about Noah. Through one man there was hope. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness. But nobody, nobody listened to his message. But God saved Noah and his family. We know that his family didn't totally listen to that message because of what happened after the flood. Okay? But God is faithful. He said, I find favor in you because of your righteous behavior that came from his faith, by faith. And he built an ark to save his family. Then he mentions Lot. And Lot, you've got to sit here and back here and say, wait a minute. Lot, I don't find him righteous. But I guarantee if you examine yourself, you're going to find you look more like Lot than you do Noah. Because of the world that we live in, that we cling to, because we trust in government programs to take care of us. We trust in our family and children to bring us happiness. We trust in money to provide for us. We trust in the freedoms that we have in this country to keep us to be able to worship without being oppressed rather than trusting in God. When Abraham, I don't know if it was Abram or Abraham at that time, <laughs> so I don't want to say it wrong. So I'll say when Abram, Abraham, slash. When he said to Lot, what do you want of this land? Lot put his eyes on the big city where the nightlife was and the things of the flesh rather than fixing his eyes on God. And he went down that path and he took his family with him. And when judgment came, Noah went in the ark. And his family went in the ark. When judgment came in Sodom and Gomorrah, God gave him time, even sent angels, everything else. I mean, much more here. Be saved Lot because he was righteous. But what happened when Lot came out of, the, out of Sodom and Gomorrah? His wife looked back. That means she had her hope and trust still in the things of this world, even as it was being destroyed. And she was destroyed along with it. Now my question for you, especially you men, is what if you live your life as like Noah instead of like Lot? Which means you need to be set apart from this world. Probabilities are let alone the grace of God and your hope in Him and His faithfulness and His love, but probabilities are that you'll save your wife and children. Just probabilities. That's why 
Solomon writes, train up a, a child in the ways of the Lord and he will not depart from it. We know that that's not an absolute, but it's a probability. If I spend my life training this, if I train him up in business, chances are he'll be a good businessman. If I train him up to play football, chances are he'll be a good athlete. If I train him up in the Lord, chances are he'll walk that way. That's the reason we do Awanas, to get them trained up. Genesis 7 verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the seventh day of the second month, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of heaven were open and the rains fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now this is what happened after God came to Noah and said, I found you righteous, build an ark. We don't know that God told him to save, that he was going to save his family, but we know that from Hebrews 11:7, Because out of holy righteous fear, Noah built an ark to save his family. It says it there. Okay? Bible specific. I messed up on the length of the ark. I asked the children also, and I'm going to ask them several questions about the ark, because the ark's one of those stories they eat up. Okay? It's one of the reasons that uh, Nathan came to Awana and made a profession of faith under Barry that he believes. I read him those Bible stories, and they were intriguing. And they're interesting because they are so far-fetched that the world wants to call them fairy tales. But they're not. They're words, they're words of God. And if they're written to be taken literally as history, they're written to be taken literally, okay? whether we want to believe that or not. And this is specific, the 600th year of Noah's life, real person, on the 17th day of the second month. That's when judgment came to the earth. Whew, Noah's suffering is over, right? He was told to build an ark. Also says in Hebrews 11, 7, that he didn't even understand what that meant because he had never seen anything like that with his eyes. So he had to believe on spiritual didn't know what a boat was. Didn't know what rain was. I get so many people that say, well, he lived by a sea, so he knew what a boat... We don't, I don't, we don't know exactly where he lived. We don't know if he knew what a boat was. They might have crossed the creeks on foot. Okay? We don't know any of those things. But he, had, we, he, he might have not ever seen rain. We do know from Scripture again, Hebrews 11, 7, that he did not know what to expect. So he walked by faith. And he did it, prepositional phrase, to save his family. He did it because holy fear and reverence for God because of who he is. Noah didn't know the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That was a hope, again, that he had to envision in his mind in salvation. All the prophets foretold about Jesus Christ and his suffering, but they had no idea the love of God that would do that. That's why the, God, the apostles didn't even recognize Jesus as suffering. He had to keep telling them over and over again, I'm going to suffer and die. Because how can you die if you're going to set up the kingdom of heaven? Okay? He's setting up the church to live in his hands and feet until the kingdom of heaven becomes sight. But guess what? He also said the kingdom of heaven is here now. And you will do greater things than I did because of the spirit that's living in each of you. Okay? How long did Noah take to build an ark? That's the question I asked Wednesday night. And the answer Bob gave it was, we don't know. Okay? What we do know, and I look back at my Bible verses, because one of the things people say is 120 years, because there's a verse that says that it repented God that he ever made man, and in 120 years, that's as long as they're going to live. He's going to get rid of them then. We don't know exactly what it means, but the don't get rid of them don't really fit. The age of man, that kind of fits, but we're not going to get off topic on doctrine that way. We're going to look at the representation of Noah build an ark to save his family. Are you building an ark on Jesus Christ to save your family? So we build an ark at the year 500. It says that Noah had three sons. As you study, they're not triplets. So the 500 is not a definite. That means at the year's age when Noah was 500, he started having children, or somewhere in his 500s he had children, whatever it means. And at the year of 
hundred in Noah's life with a specific 17th day of the second month. So I can take that one as a firm 600, but whether it is or not, we could debate that. So from 500, he started having children, to 600 when the flood came, these children are grown up and they have wives. So somewhere in between this, Noah built an ark to save his family. Something he had no idea what to do, but out of holy fear he condemned the world and was a preacher of righteousness to the world, whether they believed it or not. Whether he said day in, day out, why am I doing this? I don't see any reason for it. He never said that. He kept building an ark because he had three boys and their three wives and his wife. And he said, I have to live and build this ark. I have to live a life that's pleasing to God. I have to be set apart. Because I know God is faithful to do what He says. And He'll save my family. So the rains came. Suffering's right. Well, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, right? He was in that dark, gloomy ark, feeding all those animals day in, day out, cleaning poop. I'd say the suffering's still going on. <laughs> I would. Okay? Then it was over, right? No. It says... 150 days the water remained over the mountaintops. Well, let me read that. Genesis 8, 1 to 3. But God remembered Noah and all the animals and livestock that were with him in the ark. And God sent a wind over the earth, and the waters began to subside. The springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heaven were closed, and the rains from the skies were restrained. The waters receded steadily from the earth, and after 150 days the waters had gone down. All right, I'm through with suffering now. I've built this ark. I've been on this ark 150 days, suffering over, right? Well, let me wrap this up quickly, okay? Can I do that? Yeah, she gave me a watch that doesn't keep time. God, you're so good. <laughs> okay. 40 days of rain, 110 more days is 150 days total. We've already said that because the 40's in there. Then as you read, you'll add another 74 days plus 40 days plus 7 days plus 7 days plus 7 days plus 29 days plus 56 days. What is he talking about? Remember when he sent out one bird and then sent out another bird? And I'm going to be careful to not give my birds an order so I don't <laughs> say it wrong. Okay? I, I know what it is. But you add them all together, it's 371 days. For another year of Noah's life, when he thought salvation had come when he entered in the ark, he still had to live by faith until salvation actually came. The day that you believed in Jesus Christ, salvation did come to you. You are a child of God. The Spirit of God came to live inside of you. You are ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors making the plea of God, reconciling mankind to God. There's still that hope. You've got to live as though you're living on that ark called Jesus Christ. And whatever the suffering is, you've got to not give up hope to save your family. Noah suffered for another 371 days before God opened the ark and said, Come out in this new world. You ever thought about it that way? He's called you to live a life of suffering. So not only expect it, but anticipate it. That's what Peter writes. And be joyful in it so that others see Jesus living in you. Even if it means you're ridiculed and burned alive. Don't lose your faith in Jesus Christ. Your children are especially watching you. Genesis 8, 13 and 14. But on the 27th day of the second month, so you can verify my figures that way, you might come up with 370 instead of 371. It depends if you count the first day and last day as one whole or if you count them as one total. Okay? But 370 or 371 days. God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife, along with your sons and with their wives. What a mighty God we serve. Because one man said, I'll abandon the world and I'll live for you, God. He saved his family, but he had to work through it. Wow. So what about you? Are you going to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? 
I'm going to say this again as a reminder what suffering is, and I'm going to close. It's not punishment. It's not unfair. It does draw us to action instead of comfort. It purifies us, humbles us, makes us depend and trust on God. It casts out fear, and it brings God glory. I hope you saw that through Noah's example. When he left the ark, the first thing he did, and his children watched him, was he built an ark, an ark, an altar, and worshipped God. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your examples throughout Scripture, that you are a God of holiness. You are also a God of faithfulness. You are a God of sacrificial love. And you've called your people to be like their heavenly Father, perfect in every way. And you've equipped us with everything that we need to live that life. And you are a faithful God that will save our families. Father, we thank you and praise you for everything, for who you are. May we bind ourselves together with the Spirit to have one mindset, the mindset of Jesus Christ, to live out this world as foreigners and aliens, to proclaim the, the message of Jesus Christ, and to live like Jesus Christ. Praise, glory, and honor to be to your name and to the precious name of Jesus. Amen.